My name is Dylan Elliott. I am one of the interns over for the Counseling uh, Center here, and I'll be giving the presentation today on study skills. A little bit more about me, I'm currently interning over there for my Master's in Clinical Mental Health Counseling. Got my Bachelor's degree in Psychology and Business Administration at Lynchburg College. And I currently teach over at Lynchburg College. I teach the introductory psychology labs. So I work with a lot of people who are their first year in college and I work with them specifically on a lot of these skills and I have a lot of background working with students. So uh, I do want to go ahead and get y'all's names. I don't know, since it's a smaller group, I would like to be first name basis if you don't mind. So can we start here? Jackson. Jackson, and what's your program of study here? Program of study. Kirsten, I'm doing general studies. Okay. I'm Tammy, and I'm taking nursing. Billy, okay. um, administration. Okay. Sounds good. So a little bit of a variety here. I've got two nursing general studies, and uh, you said business. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I'm trying to keep up with everything. <laughs> All right. So we'll go ahead and get started on this. So just to throw a general question out there, how I'm going to run this, it's a little bit more of, I'll lecture a bit, give y'all some tips and tricks, but I do want to talk to y'all a lot about certain things or strategies y'all have for studying. So what is the best way for you to learn? What are the things professors do that you like the most that helps you learn material the best? So whoever wants to go ahead and answer that. I like it when they teach it. Um, uh, like if they had an online class, mm -hmm. uh, do a tutorial of the lecture. Okay. I would like that um, because I learn better to my taught me. Okay. So kind of like just walking through step by step, you're a process person. Once you see it, you can do it. Right. Okay. What about y'all? Anything in particular that professors do that really helps you or you think is really great? I like it when they like draw a diagram of like a what they're teaching. Mm -hmm. For example, in my biology class, she usually like draws like what what the topic is for the class of day. And it makes it easy for me to understand what she's teaching. Okay, so kind of seeing things visually laid out, you can't just like have a discussion class and kind of you don't get as much from that. Anything in particular for y'all? Just when they have their slides, PowerPoints are really good. Yeah, I mean that's just a habit I think a lot of people get into, especially pre presenting in general. You just tend to talk really fast and you know, stumble over your words sometimes. But I'm sure most professors, like if you ever just said like, "Hey, could you slow down? Repeat that again?" I didn't quite catch it. Most are willing to work with you on that. They wouldn't mind going back for that. Alright, so a little bit of variety with some of the stuff, but general consensus is visual stuff, seeing it done out, uh, either with a diagram, PowerPoint, that kind of stuff. But I know not all professors like to use that kind of stuff, and some classes aren't as conducive to that, so we're going to talk about some ways to kind of get around that. One thing I did want to give out to everyone, uh, are you all familiar with the VARC, or what that is? You've done, you've done it before? So I'm going to just pass this out to everyone. It's something you can just do, and if we have time at the end, we'll do it all together. So it's essentially a little questionnaire about yourself, and it's to determine how you learn best. So VARC stands for Visual, Oral, Reading and Writing, or Kinesthetic. So there's four different learning styles, and the most important thing you want to do when you're studying is you need to study in a way that connects with how you learn. So if you're a visual person, you like your diagrams, your PowerPoints, seeing it laid out helps you. You want to study in a way that you're using those skills that helps you learn the best. Oral is kind of a conversation. You learn through discussion, talking things out, reasoning it out with somebody else. Um, reading and writing, just as it sounds, you're good taking notes, reading through them again, it'll click in your mind. And with kinesthetic, you're more of like a hands-on person. You have to do something, more of the practical stuff. So answering those questions, and then it, at the very end, it has this little chart that helps you figure out exactly what learning style is best for you. So we'll do this at the end if we have time, okay? 
So, uh, I told you all my background's in psychology, and I feel like if you know some of the stuff behind how learning and memory works, it kind of reinforces it. If you understand how your brain works, you can use it better, right? So, the general steps we have to memory, we have three kinds of memory stores. First one is our sensory memory, just taking things in. As I'm talking, you're listening to me, you're taking it all in through there, all right? You, um, same way with you do anything with any of your senses. Once it's there, you're gonna try to repeat it over to yourself or practice it in your short-term memory. And through enough practice, it eventually moves into your long-term memory. But the thing about it staying in your long-term memory, it's sometimes really hard to pull it out. Have you ever had that situation where you're just like, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue, I can't remember it exactly, like I know it, it's in there, I just can't pull it out? Well, sometimes you have to backtrack and practice the stuff over again, or else you're not, never going to be able to pull it out long-term when you need it. And then we also have different ways that we encode or take information in. The problem that we run into, especially with a lot of students, is students like to just do things structurally. Especially, this can be an issue with our visual learners, because you just like to look at how things are. You, you remember things, how they're presented to you, and you're just concerned about what it looks like. Uh, sometimes with particular diagrams or a list of things, you remember the order they're laid out. The problem with doing things structurally that's the lowest form of encoding we can do. So it's sometimes really, really hard to pull out how things look from memory. You're telling a story to a friend or someone. Can you recall every little detail of everything going on around you? Probably not. The next thing that we have is phonemic or phonemically encoding. This is just how things sound. So talking things out, having the lecture uh, with the professor talking to you, teaching you the information. This is the middle ground of how things are encoded. But the best way to encode something is semantically, and this is just saying that we understand it. So you can memorize a list of things, or you can remember what the professor said, but at the end of the day, if you don't fully understand it, it's really, really hard to pull out of your long-term memory. So always going that extra mile and fully understanding how it works. That's why professors like to ask, like, apply questions. You learn this material and they're not just going to ask you to regurgitate the definition because that's very shallow encoding. They give you a situation and they're like, okay, apply these terms. What's going on here? So always like ask for examples. If things aren't fully clicking in your classes or when you're going through your notes or studying or anything, if things aren't making sense, look up examples. Simple Google search and you can find hundreds of examples on any topic you can possibly think of. And then last thing in terms of psychology of learning and memory I want to talk on was the encoding specificity principle. Basically this just says that we remember things best when we're in the same situation that we learned them. That's why you have your classes in the same room. Little things about the room, how the room feels, where people sit, the professor themselves, sometimes they can trigger memories. You see a familiar face or they're wearing an outfit that you've seen them wear before, you're just like, I know that person, but I don't know where I know them from. So we remember things best when we're in the same situation that we learned them. But you want to be able to take this knowledge with you, right? You're here to get this degree or this education, and you're going to eventually do something with it. So we need to fight this a bit. While it's nice to study in the same room, especially if you have like an office or a space in your house that you like to study or a special place on campus that you always go to, those little things can trigger certain memories. But you want to always study in new spaces because when you study in a new space, you have to re relearn that material. And then you're not dependent on those little cues to pull things out of your memory. So study in a variety of spaces. Go to Starbucks. Go different places on campus. If you have study groups, use the classrooms. You have a wide variety of options. But just doing it in the same space, you kind of become reliant on those little cues to pull things out of your memory. And we want to avoid that because you want to know this stuff in the long term. A lot of cases, it's although you may be in general studies, it may not apply directly to what you're going to do eventually, but for certain classes, you're going to want to remember that stuff moving forward. And then especially with nursing and business, there's certain things you want to always keep in the back of your head. 
So a good strategy to use there. And then just some talking points I wanted to go over. Sadly, every instructor is different. Uh, you kind of have to adjust yourself to fit their style. So the consensus that I heard from the group was a lot of visual. You, have you ever had a professor that wasn't completely visual? Yes. And how'd that go? It did not go very well. Okay. So what did they do aside from like not using like diagrams, PowerPoints, whatever they? What were the things they did that didn't necessarily agree with your style? They mostly just like lectured and talked about it, and I couldn't really connect everything together. Okay. Any other experiences with that? Something they might have done different that might not have been as helpful? Um, my teacher just tells us to read the book. Okay. Is the book, is the book at least have some diagrams or anything for some of those classes? Yes, but sometimes it's hard to still To get like this. Yeah. Okay. Well, some different ways you can combat these things. If a professor is very much like talks at you, I don't enjoy professors like that. It's not as engaging for me and I don't feel like anyone really gets anything. They sit there and talk endlessly and never ask a question. So in situations that you may run into that, a helpful thing you can do, and it sounds bad in a way, because people view it like this, you can doodle. But do doodles that are have to do with what the professor's talking about. Make your own diagrams. Don't sit there and bother you trying to get every single note necessarily, but sometimes it's good to just like kind of draw a picture of what you're thinking or what the professor's saying, or kind of connect things in that way. That might help you out. In a situation where you have to read the book, there's always online tutorials. You can always use the resources here, like the library, computers at any time. Type in YouTube, just say lecture on this. And chances are you'll probably see a lot more visual stuff. There's a lot of um, these kind of lectures where it's someone just like drawing on a board endlessly. I don't know if anyone's ever seen these videos. Yeah. So those might be a little bit more helpful if you're not necessarily understanding a concept fully and the professor's just telling you to read the book. Sorry the chat to deal with that. <laughs> Alright. Uh, another big thing on syllabus day, always make your schedule. Uh, biggest thing that people run into is they don't give themselves the time to study. You kind of have to build that in to your schedule. So write out your dates. What order do you tackle assignments? So generally here, if you have a lot of things coming up, you kind of have two options that most students go for. Do you do what's due first, or do you do what's going to take you the most time or the least time and it's easy? So what do y'all do? I do easy. <clears throat> You do the easiest? Okay. But I always try to get at least a week ahead of Good habit to get into. You were starting to say something? Yeah, I just do the easiest thing. Okay. What about for y'all? I do what's first. What's, for, what's due first? You go in the order, you're very much like this time, this time, moving on to the next thing. Okay. I just, like, car, I just put them in days, like, okay, I've got it. You know, one week for this class, okay, I've got eight days to get, okay, i got nine days, mm -hmm. you know, if you have different classes. So I, I guess I have to do what's due first because it's, okay. you know. It just makes sense in your head. It, I, I can mean, easily fall behind and, you know, and then you can be stuck like, oh crap, what is this, what? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow! <laughs> you're just like, no. Up <laughs> it's good because then you're on track, you don't forget things because everything's in the order that it's due. That makes sense. And then what about for you? I usually start with what's on the sums that are due like right away. Okay. So I got two that are go things in order and two that do it in the easiest of things first. One thing that I think really, really helps out people and they don't always do it, make a to-do list. It's very motivating to just like check off things you've already done. And some people like take a lot of joy in that because it's like you look at all the stuff that you've accomplished. And even in some cases when you're making a to-do list, put things on there that you know you've already done just so you can check them off. Because that can give you a little bit of motivation to keep going. It's a little strategy that I've always used. So. Um, and then just be sure to block out your times. 
if you have a test going up, know yourself. A lot of this has to do with how much time do I need to study to fully comprehend this? And what do I need to do to study? So make sure you just have enough time for that generally. And then always know your resources. A lot of students, I feel like, are very, very intimidated to have conversations or talk to their instructors. I can guarantee the majority of them, I can't say it for everybody necessarily, but a majority of them are really there for you and they want to help you out. So just asking them for help, they'll be able to work wonders. Never be afraid of your professors. They want you to learn, they want you to succeed. Otherwise they wouldn't be working here, would they? Why would they spend their time teaching? if they didn't want to see at least some success from students, right? I, that's one thing I love about CBCC. I live an hour away from here. Mm -hmm. and the closest school is DCC, they have a community yes. college. But when I went there, the teachers weren't interested in me learning. They threw stuff at you. And, okay. um, here, the teachers, I contact them within an hour, they replied. So, that's good. I only had that's one great. teacher that um, wasn't very helpful, but you know, that's not bad. All right, that's good. So it sounds like you have a pretty good track record here. I'm glad to hear that. It's encouraging for us and the counseling department to hear the professors are good and students are having good relationships with them. But occasionally you may run into a professor that may not be quite as helpful as you would want to be, or you may not be on the same page. People are people, we all make mistakes. We can't always meet each other on the same level, I think, too. So always use your peers, too, because everyone's in that class, you're all in it, to try to hopefully get an A. So they're a great resource to always use. Exchange contact information. If you're a person who does really well in groups and group study, definitely reach out to some of the people. You're sitting next to probably like 10, 15 people in almost every class. I'm sure some people would be willing to study together. With that big test coming up, big midterm or final, what I did when I was an undergrad, I would have groups of people and we would split up like chapters. So we would say like, okay, you take these two chapters, and make a really, really detailed study guide. And then I'll take these two chapters and make a really, really detailed study guide. Split up the work, but then we all have the same study guide at the end. And then we even met together and we would like diagram things out. Study, there's study spaces in the library, some of the classrooms here, other places you can always go. So take advantage of that. Always talk to academic advisors over the counseling center. We work specifically with a lot of this stuff and we're always eager to help you if you have particular needs that you think need addressed or you're struggling in a class because we want you to succeed. We're just like the professors. We want the best for our students. And then tutoring. There seems to be a negative stigma with tutoring. A lot of people think like, oh, I don't want to go and ask for help because that's saying that like I'm not good enough or I'm not where I should be. That is not the case. No person on this earth knows everything about everything. Ask for help when you need it. In my book, it takes a braver person to ask for help than the person who says, I'm just going to do this alone. Because a lot of people see asking for help as a sign of weakness, and it's not. I see it as a sign of courage. So definitely use those resources. There's people who are getting paid to just sit there if students aren't using it. And we have so many students that come into the counseling center every day saying, I struggle with math, I don't want to drop my math class, I don't want to do it, or I can't do this, uh, I just, I tried everything. But then we ask them, have you ever tried tutoring? And their response is nine times out of ten, no, I haven't went yet. And then the people that do end up going end up doing really, really well and sometimes even becoming tutors themselves. And it's free. And it's free. <laughs> Might as well take advantage of it. I know people uh, who were getting tutoring when I was an undergrad for like physics classes because we didn't offer tutoring for that where I went to school. And they were paying like 50 bucks a session because it was either that or nothing. Use the help that's there and available and free to you while you can. Has anyone ever went to tutoring here? Would like to admit to it? How was it for you? Did you like it? Yeah, I was too was really nice and um, I I think I've just never been in this place in my life because I, I do very well in school. Mm -hmm. It's just a particular subject 
I didn't realize it was going to be as hard as it was for me. And I was just like, oh my mercy. And so <laughs> I I wouldn't do anything because I didn't, you know, I took off work and I was like, maybe I'll just give him this class <laughs> and see if there's any ideas, you know, because I, I dedicate a lot of time to studying and stuff. It's, it's really not a problem, but some things not, you know, you know, I talk to my professors, he's really nice too. Um, I think just sometimes you just have to, some subjects are just harder, yeah. you know, to grasp than others. And, you know, when I took the tutoring, it was just so funny. I mean, she's like, oh my God, yeah, your notes look. And then she pulled out this huge pile. She's like, when I took this class, here's my pile. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, okay. she did it for me for so. I was always like, high performing student and then like when I got to foreign language for when I was an undergrad I hit a brick wall I couldn't do it I couldn't memorize anything I just don't do foreign language well and I struggled through French I had A's and everything else French and foreign language I had straight C's mm. and I had to end up getting tutoring when I was in the later classes because I was like there's no way I'm going to pass this and like the person, like when I came in, like they, I knew who my tutor was, like I knew them from other classes, and they were just surprised to see me walk in. I was like, this is just the one thing, like it does not connect in my head, and I need help. And we all have that one thing that's just not always going to connect very well, and it's good that you know that. So, so with note taking, how do you all take notes? Is there a particular way or format you do it, or you just kind of just go with the flow? Just write whatever I propose. <laughs> okay, write whatever you get down. Okay. Depends on how fast the teacher's talking. I mean, like I said, I, I've been with pretty fast talking people, and they are really nice. I'm like, you don't need to be to slow down, and we're pretty like, yes, oh my goodness, and you know, but sometimes I think they just forget. Yeah. We just have to stop writing and just listen because, like, after the class is over, all you have is your notes, or you can listen. Yeah. You know, it's kind of one or the other sometimes when they're so fast paced, like, we're taking a hybrid, like, like it's a summer class. Like, some mm -hmm. people are just so fast talking, it's just like. Yeah. You know, and then they scribble something on the board like as if I was like, oh, you might as well not even that. <laughs> you can't see it. You don't even know what it is. But you know, but it's we'll get through it somehow. <laughs> well, some things you can always do is you can always ask permission of the instructor, or I'm not familiar if you need to go through disability services of this campus for this. But if you were to record a class, those recording pens help so much. It's a solid investment for anyone in college, I say. It's this little pen where, and it comes with special paper, it's actually very, very affordable because they know the main people who are buying this are students. So you take notes with this pen, and the pen has a recorder in it, and whenever you touch a section of your notes, it'll play back whatever the professor was saying um, when you were writing that down. Or just even something to record it, um, tape recorder. Yeah. Just depends. You need to ask permission of the instructor, though. Yeah. So that's a good way to tackle that. And then also just give them that gentle nudge. I know I talk really fast when I teach my classes, and I teach seven classes a week over at Lynchburg College, and I have I just prefaced it with my students. I'm like, I talk really fast. I get really excited. And sometimes when I've taught five classes in a row, I can get pretty tired. So if I'm talking way too fast, just raise your hand. It's like, please just hold up. Let us catch up. Most professors will be totally fine with that. Because think about if you've ever had to do public speaking. Have you like went back in your head and you're like, yeah, I went really fast. Up here, you don't really notice it as much. So bear with them on that regard. And they'll, they're more than willing to work with you on those things. So, next question was, do you handwrite your notes or do you type it? Handwrite? Handwrite. Yeah, for everyone. Okay, no, that's fine. Some people it works better. Advantages and disadvantages to both. If you type it, you can tend to get a lot more information, especially if you type really, really quickly. 
Handwritten, though, generally works best for memory because it's that muscle memory of like writing the words down. But some people, it's totally fine. You just can't, that's not your thing. I can't understand the writing later. Okay. I, I no, I have, I have chicken scratch handwriting. It's been that way my entire life. And I'll uh, hand something to somebody that I wrote, wrote down and they're like, I can't read this. And then hand it back to me, I can't read it either. It's gone. <laughs> So no, it's good that, once again, knowing stuff about yourself to help you prepare the best. Uh, and then how do you organize it? Do you kind of like take notes on the chapter before coming to class, generally? Do you take notes on just the reading? Take notes on just the lecture? I may read something. Like if, they, if I have a question, I may read it to in general is don't take them just once. Rewrite them or retype them because if you do it over and over again that's that practice putting it into your long term because trust me I had an accounting professor in undergrad what he used to make us do is so when you're doing an accounting page you do credits and on the left and debits on the right so what he did for students that just couldn't get it, he gave them a brick and he's like, carry this around in your left hand and you'll never forget. <laughs> and he kept saying it over and over to yourself. So little things like that, it was just a fun thing he did. But it, and he said it always helped people. <laughs> so re, definitely rewrite your notes. It, just writing it down at one time and then even if you just go back and read it later, you're like, I can't make out what I was trying to say from this sentence always. I run into that a lot of times where I just kind of like wrote down a bunch of words and then I look at it again and like this makes no sense what I wrote down. So rewrite it. Go to class, take notes in class, and then I would say even after class or the next day, go back through it while it's still kind of fresh in your head. Rewrite it, organize it, make, make sure it makes sense for you. Um, do you tend, tend to take notes on the PowerPoint slides or what the instructor is saying? Or a little bit of both. lecturing and I'm using a PowerPoint and I tell my students the PowerPoint will be available later focus on what I'm saying but their notes are just they're writing down whatever's on the PowerPoint and I'm like you'll have this later focus on me like use that as a guide like if you need to make a note about something but generally a lot of professors can make slides available I know some are very particular um, they will not permit students to have slides and I understand that argument because also at the same time if you have slides students don't write anything because they're just like, this will be fine for studying, but it's not always the case. So kind of force yourself to just know what the professor is saying. Don't focus on mainly the slides. They're just there to guide, as you said. And then when you look over your, uh, when you study, do you look over your own notes, book, or instructor slides? What's the most helpful, generally, in your experience? A little bit of play to Book. Studying, you're just like, I gotta pull from what's there. Yeah, by the time okay. you read 
write everything and get yourself organized, sometimes it's almost that thing. <laughs> like, very, very true. Oh my God. Dylan, you might have this in there, but you have how to create a study guide based on the text. Do you have that in there? Do y'all know how to, how to take your textbook and make a study guide out of it? The yeah, the headings, all the bold headings that you have in, the, in your textbook uh, before the next topic begins. Take the bold headings, make it a question, and then there's your study guide that you can use to go through your, your chapters to study with. The headings of the So yeah, say like you were doing, the bold headings. Uh, for biology, say you were on um, something about a biology class and it was talking about like how a nerve works. Right. So the question, the bold heading would be like the process of the nerve and then you make a question for yourself saying what is the process of the nerve? Right. How does it work beginning like to end? Right. What are the parts of cells? You'd make it a question. Each, each one that you have is a next topic yeah. or a bold heading you would make it as a so definitely a good skill to have there. Because then you can pick out important things from the book, because generally those big headers are going to be the main points that the professor is probably going to hit on, especially when it comes to tests anyways. And generally you can pick out because of the bold words or key definitions, make questions out of those when you're making your study guide. And then generally what I want to touch on a bit is what do you do with these notes? Our visual learners, they're going to make flowcharts, diagrams, bulleted lists. They like to see things very organized and laid out. Auditory learners, you can make up rhymes, you can record lectures, you can read it aloud to yourself. A lot of things a lot of students don't do, but I feel like really helps some people, especially the people who need to hear it over and over again. Uh, and then our kinesthetic and hands-on people are going to make like flashcards, rewrite your notes a lot of time, draw on the boards. You just need something to do to kind of get that knowledge out of your head through a way that makes sense to you. Just some suggestions, depending on the type of learner you are. My quick little laundry list of test taking skills. So different kinds of tests are always going to need different kinds of skills. For multiple choice questions, two big things. Pick out your keywords. Students will glaze over these words all the time. Which of the following is, which of the following is not, which of the following is the best, which of the following is the worst. Circle all that apply you kind of glaze over little things like this sometimes in your tests because they're very hard to miss and especially if professors aren't like bolding and underlining them every single turn, you could miss them. The biggest thing that has helped all of my students in the past, I always tell them this, you read the question three times, read it start to finish. So first thing you do, read your question. Second thing you do, read the question again. And then you're going to read all of your answer choices. Then you read the question one last time and read all of your answer choices one last time. And then you pick an answer once and you do not change it. I can't tell you the number of tests I've created where a student had the right answer and then I see where they erased it or scribbled it out and then circled a new answer. Usually your first guess is going to be your best guess. And you're either going to know it or you're not on multiple choice questions. When you see it in front of you, 